and Yuval's magic here. Joe Valachi, a mafia hitman, and the first man to break the Omerta, the mafia's code of silence. Valachi was the first to reveal to the world the term La Cosa Nostra. Valachi was the first to reveal the names of the bosses and the soldiers. He explained the structure of the mafia, its rituals and its secrets. It was the first time someone lifted the veil or painted a picture of what the mafia was like. Valachi was the first to expose the bloody history of mafia murders and executions, and he knew where the bodies were. You live by the gun and the knife, and you die by the gun and the knife. Valachi was the first to lift the lid on a secret empire that made $40 billion a year, and his revelations would change the nature of the battle between the FBI and the Mafia forever. In 1962, 52-year-old Yuval here was serving a 15-year sentence for heroin trafficking at the Atlanta State Penitentiary, and in prison with him was his Mafia boss of 30 years, Don Vito Genovese, leader of one of the most powerful criminal families in America. Joe had known him for a long time, belonged to Vito's crew, so he knew him well, and he always thought Vito had a good opinion of him. But Vito was a homicidal maniac. One day, Vito arranged for Valachi to be his cellmate, but he couldn't because he controlled the prison wings through fear and intimidation. Valachi suspected something was up and had every reason to be nervous. Genovese considered him the one who was responsible for him being in prison for having snitched to the Federal Narcotics Bureau. One night, Vito went to his cellmate. You know, if you have a basket of apples and there's a rotten apple in the basket, that apple must be eliminated, because if they're not eliminated, they'll spoil the rest of the apples. And then Genovese kissed him on the cheek. It was the kiss of death from the mafia to let Valachi know that he was the apple that had to be eliminated. Yuval here knew what that meant. It meant he was going to be killed one way or another. Vito was going after him. Consumed by fear, Valachi saw hitmen everywhere. On the morning of June 22, 1962, while he was in the yard, he saw three inmates approaching him. Thinking they had been sent by Genovese to kill him, he grabbed an iron pipe abandoned by construction workers and prepared for the attack. Then another prisoner approached him. Valachi sprang into action. The victim of Valachi was John Joseph Saw, a small-time crook with no connections to the Mafia. Valachi had killed the wrong man, and now he faced the death penalty for murder. And there he was, trapped with no possible escape. So he informed the federal authorities that he was willing to sing like a canary to save his own skin. Valachi informed the U.S. Department of Justice that he was willing to talk about the Mafia. For Attorney General Robert Kennedy and his team at the U.S. Department of Justice, it was the opportunity they had been waiting for. Since becoming Attorney General in 1961, Kennedy had waged a vigorous attack on organized crime, but he was still struggling to penetrate the underworld of American crime. Now, for the first time in Mafia history, a member was willing to talk. So Kennedy offered Valachi a deal. He would be allowed to plead guilty to a charge of non-premeditated homicide and would be sentenced to life in prison with one condition. He would expose his organization. On July 17, 1962, Valachi was secretly taken from the Atlanta prison and flown to the Westchester County Jail on the outskirts of New York. He was given the undercover identity of Joseph Madonna and was taken to solitary confinement. FBI agent James Flynn was sent to interrogate Valachi to find out what he knew. Clint came on the scene. He was a tough guy. He told Valachi, You tell us what we want to know or you'll have no value and there will be no deal. The FBI hadn't heard the term Cosa Nostra in recent wiretaps, and they believed it referred to the Mafia, the organization, or the outfit, but they weren't sure. To get Valachi to talk, he deceived him. And he deceived me. He told Valachi what we know all about La Cosa Nostra, thinking the FBI had a deeper understanding of the Mafia than it actually did. Valachi started talking. For the first time, he revealed its meaning. It meant, our thing, La Cosa Nostra. Ah. They never called themselves the Mafia. Flynn began to coax names, dates, and information out of Valachi. And the FBI knew only the tip of the iceberg of the Mafia. They had never penetrated the organization. The floodgates opened. Valachi was aware that he had to provide information. Otherwise, he would spend the rest of his life in prison. He had to report on what was happening within the Mafia, to really pull back the curtain, to paint a picture of what life was like for a Mafia soldier in the trenches, 
so for the first time, he started to talk. Valachi began to reveal the organizational structure of the Mafia. Yes, based on his information, they designed charts that illustrated how La Cosa Nostra was divided into family units, each with a boss, a sub-boss, and lieutenants and soldiers below them for the FM, and it was like the Rosetta Stone was telling them the secrets, and the hieroglyphs began to be decoded. Valachi told Flynn that the Mafia families were spread out across the USA from Boston to San Francisco, and for the first time, the FBI had a sketch of the enormous scope of the Mafia and their activities. For three months, from the end of September 1962, Clint interrogated Valachi four times per week. A typical session lasted for about three hours. Then Valachi began to get irritated, and it was difficult to handle. Feeling realized that the main fear of Valachi was that he would never escape from Vito Genovese. Hardly a day passed without him making some reference to his old boss, sometimes completely disheartened, thinking he was going to die. Do you care what I tell anyone? Does anyone care? No one will believe you, you know what I mean. The Cosa Nostra is a kind of second government. It's too big. I'm already a dead man and I know it. Valachi had reasons to be worried. According to LCD sources, and members of the Genovese family were looking for Valachi. From his cell, Habito Genovese had established a reward of $100,000 for Valachi, and now the Mafia had placed him in the New York area. The FBI, fearful that the Mafia would reach its main witness again, moved Valachi, and this time to the high-security base of the Army in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. In the spring of 1963, Valachi decided to come out in the limelight. He wanted fervently to expose the powerful criminal organization to which he accused of ruining his life. Bobby Kennedy realized the potential he had as a person who could make public how big and important the Mafia was, but Kennedy had serious concerns about the credibility of Valachi. For the last 30 years, he had been a ruthless Mafia hitman. According to the Department of Justice, he had at least 33 murders in his name, and now he was singing to save his life. How could anyone be sure that what Valachi was telling was the truth? So the FBI decided to use that information to test his credibility. Felina had gathered material for the New York police during its interrogations. The police had been working for 30 years on painstaking murder investigations without resolve, tracing back to the wars between mafia gangs and the consequent struggle for control of power in the Cosa Nostra. Using Valachi's story as a guide, the intelligence unit reviewed the department's files in an operation that went district by district. With their detailed information, they discovered that the murders and executions of the gangs, including dates, locations, and circumstances, could be verified. Now convinced that they could trust LCD, they prepared Valachi to testify. In September 1963, Valachi was flown to Washington to testify before a Senate Investigation Committee on Organized Crime across the USA. In mid-October, he would appear as the star witness, offering first-hand testimony about his life as a Mafia hitman. The hearings were broadcast nationwide, becoming a national event. Tomorrow, and the USA is a new country. We don't have the mythology of other countries. We had Indians and cowboys, and we had gangsters, Jones said. That provided an opportunity for people in our country to watch all those underworld movies they had already seen. They put all the pieces together, and people were fascinated by all that Cosa Nostra. The Senate Committee investigates the Mafia. The Senate Investigation Subcommittee initiates new hearings against crime. Senator McClelland is its chairman. Attorney General Robert Kennedy paints a grim picture due to the increase in illegal activities of the Cosa Nostra or Mafia. He describes this organization as the government of organized crime, gambling, drug trafficking, extortion, fraud, and control of various unions. He claims their revenues are in the billions. Gentlemen, as you know, this morning we brought to the Queen's County the witness Webb, whom we are determined to expose every facet of his testimony and to continue this investigation as far as we possibly can. What has been his behavior during the conversation while they were drinking coffee? Everything indicates that he is a willing witness eager to reveal what he knows. He has not posed a difficulty. He seems worried, I would say not, given the circumstances. The man is naturally nervous and somewhat restless, but other than that, he is a good witness. 
Do you not feel that he is rather enjoying all this? I prefer not to comment. As the hearings commenced, Valachi was asked why he had killed another prisoner in jail. Why did you decide to kill him in that place and at that time? Because he was the guy I saw at that moment. In other words, you felt that was your last day? Speaking frankly, Senator, I felt it was my last day, the last day I would be alive. You thought you could take them all out before they took you out? Probably. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't seen him. I can't answer what I would have done. So, you felt helpless and surrounded and decided to attack when you could? When I saw him, I thought that if I killed that man who I thought was going to kill you, then I would feel satisfaction, Senator, let's put it that way. I felt satisfaction. Despite all the turmoil surrounding that public event, Valachi's testimony was a stark reminder that he was a cold-blooded killer. Then Valachi's interrogation truly began. When did you become a member of that organization? In 1930. What is the name of the organization? Cosa Nostra, in Italian. Our thing and our family in our language. Our thing and our family in our language. At 18, he was the driver of a famous band called the Minutemen. The Minutemen who robbed hundreds of clothing and jewelry stores between 1919 and 1923, smashing shop windows and taking everything they could before the police arrived. But one day they were caught, and Valachi was sent to the infamous Xingxing prison by the Hudson River. At the age of 21, he became friends with a gangster named Alessandro Bolero. It was then that Valachi first heard about a secret organization that he would soon come to know as La Cosa Nostra, the mafia which he wanted to be a part of. Now I am going to talk about life. I was a chauffeur, something that had been known for many years, and in fact other bands tried to hire me, but I never wanted to leave. Valachi explained to the Senate committee how he had become a driver for one of the most powerful mafia bands in New York, led by the Sicilian-born Salvatore Maranzano. It was 1929, and Maranzano was not caught up in a bloody power struggle with his adversary Giuseppe Seri. Valachi let Maranzano know that he wanted to be part of his mandate, and as a test, he was sent as a hired driver for the assassination of one of Maseria's top henchmen. After the murder, Valachi received the call that he was going to be a soldier in the Mafia. Valachi then revealed to the committee the rituals of his initiation ceremony to enter the Mafia. He described how he had been taken to a farmhouse about 150 kilometers from New York City. They asked him to sit with 30 other members around a table. Their boss, Don Salvatore Maranzano, was not going to conduct the initiation. And he told them how they were initiated into the offer of the code. Ah! and that once you became a member, you could never leave, and you had to either make money or be a hitman, killing someone just to be considered for initiation. Valachi then revealed to the Senate committee the secrets of the blood and fire initiation ceremony to enter the Mafia. Ah, uh, he had the knife and gun on the table, and then explained that you live by the gun and knife, and you die by the gun and knife. Did you fully understand what that meant? If the effect and what it meant, well... It meant that he expected to die by the gun and knife when he made that oath. He assumed that one day he would die by a gun or a car. That's right, and that's what he thought about dedicating himself. That's right. Valachi said they asked him to place his hands in a cup shape. They put a piece of paper inside and lit it. Then they asked him to move his hands from side to side and told him that he would suffer the same fate as the paper if he betrayed the secrets of La Cosa Nostra. Valachi was then introduced to his sponsor, his godfather, Joe Bonanno, who would be his guide and mentor. Bonanno asked Valachi to show him his index finger and pricked it with the pin from his tie. Then he pricked his own and placed it on Valachi's. Then Maranzano announced that they were all family now. All right, what happened then? Then we stood up, shook hands, and recited some words together that I don't remember well. Also in Sicilian. Do you know what they meant? Well, the truth is, I never asked what they meant. I never asked, but they meant that it was some kind of organization or something like that, but one doesn't pay attention. I never bothered. I never bothered to find out what they meant, but I can get an idea. You can get an idea of what we're all tied up. We're all tied up. We're all together. We're together. We're together. We sing together. We go out together. We live together. That's it. Valachi's revelations explained why the secret organization had managed to remain hidden for so long. 
Ah, whoever let it slip paid the highest price. Fear had preserved silence for thirty years. Now Valachi had broken that silence forever. Senator, can I say one thing, Senator? Yes, what I am now telling you would have to keep quiet and not say anything else. What I am exposing to you, to the press, and to everyone represents my death sentence. I am breaking a promise that I should never break. Even if I speak, I should never speak about this. And yet I am doing it. And the Mafia, of course, was horrified. In the past, they had managed to kill people who were in jail, and they thought that if they offered enough money, they would find someone willing to kill him. With the $100,000 contract offered, because depending on Valachi's head, there were well-founded fears that the Mafia might attempt to attack the Senate hearings. What can you tell us about that threat, Gene? Well, over the weekend, we received information from the FBI referring to the possibility that someone could place a bomb in the room this morning, and also the possible presence of one or several armed people willing to kill the witness. What precautions have you taken? We shouldn't comment on that issue. They have informed Mr. Valachi, and we haven't done it. It seems that there is information that someone intended to shoot him or place a bomb in this room. Where did they get that information? What did you think of it? What do you want me to tell you? I'm in the same situation. From the beginning, I've been playing the same game. From the beginning, you know what I mean. That doesn't change anything. Valachi devoted most of his testimony to mapping out the hierarchical structure of the American Mafia. Valachi explained how the efficient organization that the Mafia had become had evolved from the confrontation between street gangs and power struggles in the early 20th century. Before the senators, Valachi went back to a meeting held in 1931 where the Sicilian boss, Salvatore Maranzano, took control of the New York Mafia. Valachi recounted how Maranzano outlined his ambitious plan. The gangs of New York would now be organized into five families, each of which would control the neighborhoods of the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and Staten Island. Balek and recounted how Maranzano had declared himself the supreme leader. He would be the chief of all activities and anyone who opposed would be killed. Balek then explained that a man had disagreed. He revealed how Charles Lucky Luciano had had Maranzano executed. Luciano then introduced a more democratic form of leadership. He eliminated the figure of the boss of all bosses and created the commission, a board of directors for all intents and purposes, to resolve disputes within the Mafia. And this led to a time of peace, cooperation, and prosperity. Next, Balek named the current leaders of the five New York families, Vito Genovese, Carlo Gambino, Joseph Bonanno, Joseph Joe Bananas Bonanno, Vito Genovese. These are the men, Balek said, to the committee that led an enormous organized crime network in the city spanning gambling, prostitution, usury lending, narcotics, and the Mafia's infiltration into legal businesses. How many soldiers does a boss usually command? Well, in Vito Genovese has about 450, give or take 400, 450, and about 450, maybe even 500. Valachi then revealed the names of more than 130 members of the Genovese crime family and identified members of all the other New York families, claiming to know 289 mafiosos. All of this was presented to the committee in five huge diagrams of the families. What Valachi did was provide data that the FBI already had, but didn't know they had. Often, Mafia members and others in criminal activity know each other by their aliases. They may know each other by sight, but not always by their real names. And although law enforcement knew their real names, it was the first time they realized what they truly had. Apart from that, I think Valachi's testimony stands on its own, and over time, its veracity has been proven. He marked each diagram with a star for the individuals he could identify from the five families. Those who didn't appear, he knew by their aliases but not their real names. So he committed to identifying those members of the Mafia for whom he could provide both their real names and aliases. Exactly. Very well. He was the one who exposed everything. The families, the names of their members, and the levels of authority, starting from the capo down to the soldiers. However, there were some critics who doubted Valachi's testimonies, considering that a foot soldier would never have been privy to information about the core of power within the Cosa Nostra. 
I think it's a mistake to consider soldiers as insignificant figures. They are important people within the Mafia. The only people above the foot soldier in the direct chain of command are the capo and the boss, so the soldier holds a relevant position simply by being admitted as a member. They are given access to the secrets of the Mafia, they are informed about what's going on and need to know who's who within the Mafia because they have permission to eliminate anyone outside the organization but not within it. So, they are usually well informed. He used his testimony to get full revenge. I think I've come to this point. Could you briefly explain how much power, how much authority a boss like Genovese has over the family, over the soldiers like you, Senator? I know well the power wielded by Genovese. Not only does he wield power within our family, he also controls power in the Gambino family and in the Lucchese family. In short, his word becomes law. It's an authorized act. Yes, it is. And he hands down death sentences. Well, they hand them down and then they tell you he was a rat, he was this or that, they tell you what they want. So they hand them down, that's right. He knows from his own experience, don't doubt it for a moment. Valachi's testimony was worth its weight in gold. It confirmed that the Cosa Nostra was the Mafia, revealed the names of the bosses and their soldiers, explained its structure, rituals and secrets, and exposed its bloody history. But above all, Valachi's testimony provided the FBI with precise targets and led to a change in priorities. In 1963, the FBI's New York office increased the number of agents specializing in organized crime from 4 to 140. The following year, the FBI used hidden microphones to record Teamsters union boss Jimmy Hoffa in a series of exchanges with the Detroit Mafia. He was sentenced to eight years in prison. For the FBI, electronic surveillance was the tool of the future to defeat organized crime. As a young agent in the early 1970s, we conducted a nationwide campaign of wiretapping on interstate gambling operations controlled by the Mafia. We made thousands of arrests and dismantled hundreds of major gambling networks in an effort to cut off one of their major sources of income. Thanks to the revelations of Valachi and the FBI's campaign against the Mafia took a qualitative leap. Although it was only the beginning, for Attorney General Robert Kennedy, the testimony of Joseph Valachi and others with knowledge of criminal operations across the country provided an unprecedented understanding of how these operations functioned. Valachi and was the first subordinate of certain relevance whose testimony helped to bring down and destroy, or at least injure, the Mafia in America. Without him, it would have taken another 15 or 20 years because there were no informants. Although his rank was secondary, he knew enough to cause anticipation and to seriously alert and warn the public about the threat posed by the Mafia. As for Joe Valachi, he returned to the relative comfort of the prison in the District of Columbia in Washington, where he had remained during the hearings. Robert Kennedy, with his proverbial shrewdness, believed that Valachi and had much more to offer. Kennedy realized that Valachi and was a gold mine. It occurred to him that he should write his memoirs, recounting what he could remember about the Mafia. For 13 months, Valachi and wrote diligently in his Washington cell, jotting down over 300,000 words in notebooks. He had been a witness since the early days of modern mafia, and his story was a unique portrait of the day-to-day -day life of a hitman over a period of 30 years. As someone with little education, Valachi and's memoirs were not exactly a literary masterpiece. They were unpublishable and perhaps illegible. Kennedy requested that an anonymous collaborator be hired. The Department of Justice tasked writer Peter Maas with working on the memoirs and speaking with Valachi and about his life. The goal was to shape a book that the Department of Justice hoped would encourage other informants to come forward. The department began making plans to reward Valachi and for his cooperation and even considered sending him somewhere to relax in the sun. Bobby Kennedy had the crazy plan to find him a girlfriend or bring his wife and take them to a deserted island where he could live the rest of his life. And yet, even as he contemplated the sentence for killing his fellow convict, the wrong man, there was another obstacle. The Italian-American newspaper Il Progresso had obtained Valachian's manuscript and was outraged. They published a scathing editorial against the imminent publication of the book, claiming that it perpetuated the image of criminality associated with the multiple Italian names mentioned in Valachi and testimony. This opinion spread, 
until it became a massive protest from lobbying groups proclaiming that the book denigrated all Italian-Americans. The White House campaign was forced to intervene and halted its publication overnight. Valacian's life changed drastically, and he was returned to the harsh federal prison system. He was locked in a cold, cramped cell in Michigan, where he was to serve the remainder of his sentence in isolation. Valachi and was desperate. On the morning of April 11, 1966, he ripped the power cord from his radio and headed to the shower corner. Well, the pipe couldn't bear the weight of Valachi, and who a guard found shortly after collapsed on the floor, barely alive. The Department of Justice realized that they needed to better care for their star witness. They removed him from the unpleasant prison up north and sent him to the place they thought would be best for him, a place called La Tuna, near the Mexican border in Texas. They put him in a suite with an American kitchen and a more comfortable bed, trying to make his life as comfortable and pleasant as possible. And when the Department of Justice now gets a top informant, they send them what is called the Valachi Suite. In 1968, five years after he had revealed the secrets of the Mafia to the world, Valachi and finally got to read the book based on his life. It was titled The Valachi Papers and became a bestseller. Valachi and didn't receive a cent. The book was made into a movie in 1972, with Charles Bronson playing the character of Valachi. The real Joe Valachi died of a heart attack in 1971 at the Federal Correctional Institution in La Tuna, Texas. He survived his mafia boss, Vito Genovese, by two years. The $100,000 reward for Valachi's head offered by Genovese was never collected.